Welcome again. Right now we're on John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. And this is where Jesus is sentenced to death. So Pilate then took Jesus and flogged him. In that verse alone, there's a lot to talk about. Because when Jesus was flogged, he was beaten more than most people realize. You know, back in those days, uh, they say they had a Roman cat of nine tails. For those of you who do not know what Roman cat of nine tails is, it's like a big whip and it has nine strands on this whip. And on the end of each one of these strands, there are pieces of metal or glass, something sharp, that would dig right into the, the person that they're whipping. And that explains why, that explains why the scripture says that they plowed my back. They plowed it, okay? They just didn't beat it with a with a stick or hit it or punch them. No, he was torn, he was ripped apart, okay? They plowed his back like a field. Uh, it also says that they pour, they pulled out his beard. Now, that is a very, very painful thing. I think that probably pulling a beard out might be even more painful than just pulling the hair off your head. It is a very, very painful thing. And also, we know that in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, it says that he was so disfigured that you could hardly recognize him, okay? This is how bad it was. Not only was he disfigured, ripped apart, his back was plowed like a farmer's field, his beard was torn out, but he was also hung completely naked. Very, very humiliating thing in the public, on a cross, crucified, to death, naked. It was When it says in the scriptures that he went to the cross in humility and he became obedient unto death, it is very great humility that he took upon himself in order to sustain all of this, knowing, as he said, he could call thousands of angels to help him out in an instant, but he didn't. Now, before we get too deep into this, before we get too deep into the the uh, mocking and the flogging and the crucifixion, I want to say this. You know, there are some people out there, you know, and I, I know there are churches that exist that, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, an event like Good Friday where they talk about the crucifixion, you know, people are sad and they kind of make it a sad. They tone the, the, the whole service as a, you know, a very mournful thing. Well, really, uh, in the scriptures, it says that it pleased God to crush him. It pleased the Lord to crush him, okay? It was God's good pleasure for this to happen. It says that he endured the cross out of joy. Out of joy, he endured the cross. Now, remember, you got to very, you got to guard yourself against this kind of thinking where it's like very mournful, very bad, very sad, because this is what Peter did when Jesus was talking about his crucifixion. Peter said, oh, Lord, no, not you. Oh, far be it from you to be crucified, to be mocked like that, to be torn apart like that, to be hung naked like that. No, no. I mean, that's a that's a very sorrowful thing. That's a very sad thing. Far be it from you to, to experience that. That's just too much for us to think about. Jesus didn't say, oh, well, that's okay. He didn't comfort him. He said, get behind me, Satan, for you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Why do you say that? Because he knew, again, because for the joy set before him, he endured. He humbled himself. And this is what makes it so beautiful. He took upon himself great humility and humbled himself obediently on to death. And he did it in joy, in the beauty of the crucifixion. Okay, this is from a fleshly point of view, from a carnal point of view, Yeah, this is very gruesome and very sad, very mournful. But from God's point of view, it is a very, very glorious thing. You know, this is really the axiom. This is the pivotal point of all Scripture, okay? This is the pivotal point. When you read the Tanakh, when you read the so-called Old Testament, a lot of it 
talks about the crucifixion and the resurrection, may I add. You know, and this, you know, I am so excited just thinking about going through the Tanakh with you, going through the Torah, the, the, the prophets, the Ketuvim, the writings, the scriptures. You know, a lot of these documents from the Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, and then some, a lot of it talks about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And it talks about the first coming and the second coming as well. I am so excited just thinking about what's coming, okay? I just, uh, you know, we got to take this one step at a time, but it is going to be very good. Let's get on with the reading. Verse 2. The soldiers twisted thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple garment. Now, in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, one of the curses, or at least a symbol of the curse of God, was thorns. Remember, God said, you know, the ground is more or less cursed because of your sin, and it will produce thorns and thistles instead of all the wonderful, you know, produce that you've been experiencing. It will produce a lot of thorns and thistles. Thorns and thistles is a symbol of sin. Don't forget, you know, that it says that Yeshua, Jesus, became sin for us. Okay, he became sin for us on the cross and he died so that when we look at that, we can say, wow, sin died. There is the sin of my previous life and it died. Okay, and when he rose again, you can say, I have risen with him in newness of life. I am born again. That is why, and I know some of you who are listening to a lot of these teachings, you know, I say this a lot, but that is why Paul said, you know, how can you, who are dead to sin, how, how can you be dead, dead to sin? Well, by faith, by faith in the cross. When he died, I died. I am crucified with Christ, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's the, there's the gospel in a nutshell, <laughs> really. That's better than John 3, 16, really, honestly, okay? Galatians 2, verse 20 is better gospel, you know, nutshell than John 3, 16 is. I mean, because it tells you about the end of sin. And that is what we all need to be focused on because that's what God is focused on. God cares about putting sin to death in your life. And also, this verse that we just read talks about a purple or scarlet garment that they put upon Jesus. Again, the color of purple or scarlet is a symbol of sin as well. It's a symbol of sin, okay? So when they were doing this to Jesus, they didn't know. It was by ignorance, as the book of Acts says, through ignorance, the rulers of this world put to death the Messiah. You crucified the Messiah through ignorance. And you know what? I wanted to save this for later, but I got to give it to you now because it is just so good. You look again, I mentioned about the Garden of Eden. I mentioned about Adam and Eve. But the whole thing from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross is an inversion, is, what will I say? Like not... It's more than just the opposite. It's, it's the opposite of, but it's like an inversion of the Garden of Eden. Put it this way. The Garden of Eden, Eden actually means delight, okay? The Garden of Eden, that is where sin came into the world. How did it come into the world? It says that Eve saw the fruit of the tree. It was pleasant to the eyes, good for food, and desirable to make one wise, so there we have the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Desirable for food. Oh, that's the lust of the flesh. For those of you who know, uh, the lust of the flesh comes in different, different ways, okay? The lust of the flesh, a lot of you know it as a sexual immorality thing, but also the lust of the flesh could also be a food thing. I mean, gluttony can be just as much a part of lust of the flesh as sexual immorality. 
as well as um, you know materialism or worshiping mammon, worshiping money. All this kind of stuff is the lust of the flesh. When Eve looked at the fruit and saw that it was good for food, there's the lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes. Obviously, that it was good. It was a very beautiful thing to look at. And desirable to make one wise. There we got the wisdom of this world. Desirable to make one wise, therefore puffing you up in pride. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The scriptures say that those things are not of God, not from the Father, okay? That is what the scriptures say very clearly. So Eve took the fruit off of the tree in the Garden of Eden. God went back to the garden, so to speak, except this time is the Garden of Gethsemane. And he reversed the whole process. He took the fruit, and for those of you who know Jesus, Yeshua, another name for him is the first fruits, the fruit, okay? The first fruits from the dead, the first fruits of God. He is the fruit. So in the garden, I know some of you are getting this right now. So in the garden of Eden, sin came into the world by Eve taking the fruit off of the tree. God reversed it by going back to the garden, except this time Gethsemane, and from there, and through this process we're reading, to the cross, he put the fruit, Jesus, back up on the tree, the cross. And he reversed the whole thing. Instead of it being lust of the flesh, my, he wasn't very, it, the lust of the flesh was far from the thoughts of anybody when they were looking upon Jesus at that time. And pleasant to the eyes, no, 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 not close to it. Desirable to make one wise, it was through the ignorance, as it says in the book of Acts, the ignorance of the rulers of this world that Jesus was crucified. The thorns, the scarlet, the purple robe, all symbolic that Jesus became sin or was made to be sin, to be put back up onto the tree so that we can say our sin is dead and we have risen afresh in newness of life by faith of the resurrection. This is awesome, okay? I wanted to save this for later, but this is just so good. I have to just talk about it now. Verse 3. They kept saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they kept slapping him. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you, that you may know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Jesus therefore came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple garment. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Very interesting that he calls Yeshua the man. Because you see in the Hebrew, that is Adam. Wow. Okay. This is the seed of Adam prophesied back again in, in Genesis where it said that this, the woman's seed, the seed of Adam, Ben Adam, the son of man, will crush the serpent's head. Awesome. Behold Adam. Behold Adam. This is your Adam. This is your man. Remember Paul said, Adam, as in book of Genesis, Adam, is the first Adam, whereas Jesus is the second Adam. So awesome. So awesome. It's so amazing to see this all come together. And again, there's so much to talk about. I mean, I could spend literally hundreds of hours here talking about this kind of stuff because a lot of the Tanakh talks about this. And you know what? I'm going to save a lot of it for when we are reading the Tanakh because there's just so much to talk about it. We need to take this one step at a time. Verse 6, when therefore the chief priests and the officers saw him, they shouted, saying, crucify, crucify. Hey, how many times do I say this? When Jesus was set before him, if Jesus was this nice, so nice, loving guy, why would they say crucify, crucify? Why would they want to crucify? Why would they want him dead? Why would they want to take a nice guy, such a guy that would just go around and love everybody and do such a very horrendous and very, very 
terrible things such as a crucifixion. So much humiliation, so much pain, and death. Why would they want to do that to someone who just preaches love and just loves everybody? The answer is, and I know that you know some of you know this, Jesus made people angry. That is just a fact. That is what the scriptures tell us. He made people angry a lot, okay? Not just once, not just twice, but he made people angry a lot. He would confront them. He would preach righteousness. He would preach against their hypocrisy. He would call them names. He used the term hypocrite. He used the name hypocrite a lot, okay? It seems like that was his favorite word. Hypocrite, you're such a hypocrite. He called people sons of hell, sons of Satan even in John chapter 8. Called a woman a dog. So, yeah, he made people angry. That's that could that be um, put it this way could that be one of the reasons why they were all so angry at him they said crucify him crucify him. remember time and time again they wanted to kill him they tried to get him they tried to arrest him they wanted him dead they took up stones at one point to stone to kill him right there on the spot without a trial that is why you see, so many preachers, Christians, church leaders today are not, they're not very good examples of Jesus. They're exam they are examples of the fake Jesus, the fake Yeshua, the golden calf Jesus, like I call it. You know, Aaron made the golden calf, Jeroboam made the golden calves. Why, why golden calf? Because you know the calf or the young bull is one of the signs, one of the symbols, the heavenly symbols of the creatures around God. That's one of the, one of the, uh, one of the animals that symbolize one of the characters of God. See, the, a calf is just so friendly looking and not so not so fierce as a lion, or or not so much of a you know a, an animal of prey such as a, an eagle, you know, not so offensive as some like a man might be, but just a calf, okay? And they make it golden. They make it beautiful looking. They make it so that it just kind of decorates the scenery. It's just beautiful. It just sits there. It doesn't rebuke your sin. It just blesses you. And that's what these people do today with Jesus. They make him into a golden calf. That is the golden calf of today. It's a nice, hyper nice, goody two-shoe Jesus that just goes around loving everybody according to their definition of love. I, I, of course, I mean, and Jesus, the real, real Jesus did love people, but not using the love in the same way that these people say, okay? Because nowadays, if you just say something sin, it's like, oh no, that's hate. Ridiculous, ridiculous. That's not, I mean, Jesus, if that's, if that's true, then Jesus did it all the time, okay? He, he called people out all the time for their sin, called them out all the time. Verse 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. See, there's no question here whether or not Jesus actually claimed to be the Son of God. No question about it. Uh, he did. He called. He made it very clear that he was the Son of God. Verse 8, when therefore Pilate heard this saying, he was more afraid. Remember now, Pilate really didn't want to crucify Jesus. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. He didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus at all. Pilate was stuck between a rock and a hard place because he had the, a certain law to go by, the people that were pressuring him, and then he had Jesus that he didn't believe deserved death. And then when he heard that, that he claimed to be the Son of God, he was even more afraid. He entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? It's like, can you just imagine now, like right at this point in time, I can just picture Pilate just shaking, okay? Like, first of all, I heard so much about you. Second of all, these people say you're a man of great miracles and God's got to be, I mean, just 
common sense says God's got to be behind this somehow. And then they, all these people want you dead and, and they say they got, you know, evidence against you to crucify you. you know, the most horrendous punishment that you could ever have. And, and I don't see anything in you at all. And, and I'm being pushed and I'm being pulled and I'm being pressured. I'm being, I'm stuck. I am cornered here. And I'm afraid and I'm nervous. And then I hear that you claim to be the, the son of God. It's like, hold on a second, everybody. I got to go uh, for a minute. And he goes back to talk to Jesus again. Uh, where are you from? Where are you? Where? Tell me, where are you from? Listen, I'm really nervous right now. Really, I, I just, I'm afraid. Really afraid. Like my wife just said, she had a dream about you and she suffered so much in a dream. All this stuff that I'm seeing here, I am shaking in my boots. Tell me, Jesus, please tell me, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Oh, talk about the silent treatment. <laughs> wow. Uh, this, in all of Pilate's life, I'm sure if there was any time he needed to have an answer, it would have been this time. And he got no answer. Now, some of you might think, well, wouldn't Jesus, you know, kind of have a little bit of mercy on him? Just like, you know, being as nice as he is, wouldn't he just kind of see that he's so afraid and just try to, you know, comfort him a little bit, just kind of love on him a little bit? Nope. Pilate got none of that. He got absolutely no answer. The worst thing that Pilate could ever have receive from him silence especially at this point in time verse 10 Pilate therefore said to him aren't you speaking to me don't you know that I have power to release you and have power to crucify you so at this time you can just imagine Pilate is using everything he can use in his power to try to pry information out of Jesus He's trying to manipulate him now. He's trying to, he's trying to scare Jesus now. He's like, I have power to crucify you, okay? Like, God, come on, give me an answer now. I can, I can put you to death, you know that? Come on, you know? Trying to intimidate Jesus a little bit. Verse 11, Jesus answered, You would have no power at all against me unless it were given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has greater sin. At this, Pilate was seeking to release him. Oh, yeah, no doubt. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you aren't Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Now, the Jews here, they were like, they were putting on a show. They were putting on like as if they really were loyal to Caesar. The Jews, loyal to Caesar? They made it sound like, hey, you know, uh, if you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar. You're gonna, you are committing crimes against Caesar. So, you know, sometimes this is what happens in life, okay? Right here, Pilate got what he gave to Jesus. You know, he tried this manipulation scare tactic on Jesus to try to get Jesus to do what he wanted him to do. And pretty much instantly, God repaid Pilate with the same kind of treatment. Pilate got the scare tactic from the crowd. If you release Jesus, you are no friend of Caesar's. You are going against Caesar. You're going to be committing a crime against Caesar. So there, Pilate just got what he, what he gave, okay? He reaped what he sowed. Let me say this. Sometimes God will repay you for your evil instantly. Sometimes you will reap the evil that you sowed instantly. Sometimes it may take days. Sometimes God waits, waits months. Sometimes God waits years. And sometimes for the really unfortunate of you, God waits until judgment day. It's better that actually God does it in this life because that would give you a chance to at least, you know, be sorry, repent. The worst thing God can do to you is make you wait until judgment day to pay for the sins that you've done against other people. Verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, at about the sixth hour. 
Now, right here in the notes, it says the sixth hour would have been 6 a.m. according to the Roman timekeeping system or noon for the Jewish timekeeping system in use then. I believe since this was written by a Jew, John was a Jew, that John was giving you the Jewish timekeeping system. Would have been about noon. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Boy, they hated him, didn't they? I'm sure in their own minds they had reason to hate Jesus. They loved their sin too much. They loved themselves and they held on to pride a little bit too much. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? You see, Pilate is trying to get out of it. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the crucifixion of Jesus. He's shaking in his boots, okay? He's being pushed on every side. He's really in this situation, apart from Yeshua himself, he's got to be the worst man in the picture right now. I mean, he's getting it from every side. The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. They're still playing the Caesar card here. So then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. So that concludes our reading for this portion. And like I said, this is just so awesome. This is just so, so good. I mean, really, it's so good. This is the focal point of much of Scripture right here. You know, apart from the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus himself, this is quite the moment we are at right now. So don't miss the next teaching. And as you go, may God enlighten you, open the eyes of your understanding, give you a mind and a heart to receive what God has to show you right now. I pray that God shows you things that you've never seen before. And always remember, call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Thank you.